good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring. And we are going to, well, I'll just go ahead and tell you what, I, what I've done, and most of you who are on here already know what we've done. Uh, yesterday I shared quite a few songs on our public Facebook page. I tell you, it's a weird time right now. Um, churches all across the country and all around the world have not opened their doors this morning to a public assembly. But we have, a, we have the ability, because of technology and because of uh, things like Facebook and YouTube, to still study God's Word together. Uh, and and in one, I guess in one sense, still have fellowship with each other, although uh, it's quite different looking at a camera instead of a congregation full of people. I'm used to sitting or standing up right about now in front of a congregation of about 130 to 150 members and shaking hands and, and greeting people. Uh, but because of the current condition, the current situation in our country, we know that things are not like they have been for so long, like we're so used to, like we're so used to seeing them. And so it, with that in mind, I want to share some thoughts today about asking this question, is there anything different? And I want to, we can look at this in a couple of different ways. Um, the, the primary way that I want to consider this idea, this question of, is there anything different? So like I said, we're not, uh, we're not assembled here um, in Mammoth Spring. I've got people online right now who are saying, our house is watching with you. You know, it's interesting when you read the pages of the New Testament that that's exactly what you have. You have house churches, um, and I, I see people keep on joining in. I'm so glad that you're here this morning, and I hope that you're... It, so what we're doing here at Mammoth Spring, we're, we're presenting a lesson from God's Word, but I hope you worship at home. You know, there's more to worship than just, just um, reading the Bible. There's a lot more to it that the... Lord's Church does on the first day of the week. I just had somebody join from Pennsylvania. Glad to have you in here with us today from Cotters Point, Cottersport, Pennsylvania. So anyway, what I was saying is um, the, the church of the New Testament didn't have buildings. The preacher didn't have an office. They didn't have fellowship halls. They met in people's homes. Um, and, and we read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, Romans chapter 16, other places in the New Testament <clears throat> where you have churches meeting in homes. The Church of Christ in Jerusalem started out with about 3,000 members, uh, according to Acts chapter 2. The number of the men then grew to about 5,000, according to Acts chapter 4. They didn't meet in one place. But anyway, that's, that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, we're here. We're studying together, and... Uh, I want to ask this question, answer this question, really, is there anything different? There's quite a bit different right now. Um, like I said, about now I'm used to standing up in front of a, of a congregation and preaching to an audience of people. Um, instead, I'm sitting in my office talking to a camera, but I know that there are a lot of you out there listening. The, the, um, the churches of Christ, when we assemble upon the first day of the week, we do so as a as a uh, modeling what the church of the Bible did. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he said, uh, I will build my church. Okay, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And we know that that church was established in the city of Jerusalem. It's recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. Um, the apostles of, of Jesus were given the keys to the kingdom, and they opened the doors to the church there in Acts chapter 2. And for the first time in history in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we read about people being added to the church. When you follow then the model of the church of the New Testament, you see them doing certain things. For instance, um, as persecution was growing against the church, we read about it in Acts chapter 12. Uh, James was beheaded, Peter was thrown into prison, and we're told in Acts chapter 12 and verse 5 that, the, that prayer was made constantly by the church for Peter. <clears throat> we see the church in the New Testament uh, assembling on the first day of the week. So I've got my Bible open here to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where beginning in verse 17, the Apostle Paul is discussing 
uh, where the Apostle Paul is discussing some abuses of the, that the Corinthians were making of the Lord's Supper. The Corinthian church had turned the Lord's Supper into a common meal, and that's what's being condemned here. And he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as the church, that's talking about the assembly of the local congregation. And the assembly of the local congregation in Corinth was abusing the Lord's Supper. They weren't doing it the way the Lord had intended it to be done. And what he had intended begins in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, and it goes down through verse 26, where the Lord took bread, blessed it, broke it, and told the disciples to eat because this was his body that was broken. And it was to be done in remembrance of him. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. He took the cup and divided it among the disciples. And it's interesting when you read Luke's account in Luke chapter 22, as Luke records the institution of the Lord's Supper, he gives us an order as to how it was done. He, he passed out the fruit of the vine. He said, divide this among yourselves. And then they took the bread and then they drank of their uh, containers uh, of the fruit of the vine, which was an emblem of the Lord's Supper. And so we have this going on here. That's what should have been going on in the church at Corinth. You have prayer. You have prayer, Acts 11, or I'm sorry, Acts 12 and verse 5. You have the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to really to the end of the chapter. You have the church singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in their hearts to the Lord, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. The New Testament talks about singing in the sense of, of praising God with the fruit of our lips, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. So my point being, we know what the church looked like. We know what the church did. We know how the church functioned in the first century. Is there anything different for us today? Well, there shouldn't be. There are some minor differences. There, <laughs> again, I've already mentioned this. We have, we have structures to meet in that, that allow us to fulfill that command to meet upon the first day of the week. There's nothing wrong with having a church building. There's nothing wrong with meeting in a place like that to worship. This building is nothing more than an expedient. Uh, with the current situation, with the, the social distancing and all these things that we keep hearing about, keeping your distance from people, stay-at-home orders that are being given around the country, the church is not assembled in one building uh, here, but there are homes all over. I'm looking right now uh, at my screen. I've got people from Florida, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Arkansas, Ohio, who are studying God's Word together. While we're not in one location, we are all still, uh, we, we all still have our minds on God. We're thinking about Him. So in that sense, yes, some things are very different today and probably for the next few weeks. But I want to I take a bigger, a bigger thought here, uh, go a little bit deeper than just what, what I've been talking about with the, um, uh, with the local assembly and what, what, a, what, a, what we call a worship service, what that should look like. It should look like it looked in the New Testament. We don't have any right to change. We don't have any right to say, hey, listen, uh, you know, if we partake of the Lord's Supper, okay, we've also got some folks here from Georgia, somebody just commented. So there, we've got folks from all over. We don't have any right to say, hey, listen, we want to we change some things, the way the church does some things, be because if you, you know, if you do things too often, they become, you know, they become kind of commonplace. And just a prime example of what I'm talking about is how many churches meet upon the first day of the week, and they, they don't partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Now, we know for a fact that that's how it should be done. That's how the first century church did it. And again, that's the church that was instituted, that was established, promised to be built by Jesus, and it was established upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Ephesians chapter 2, verses, uh, oh, I think that's verse 22. We need to look like they looked. We need to look like what they looked like. We need to do what they did. I, I think one thing... I, and I think a good thing that could come from what we're going through right now here in Mammoth Spring or in Georgia or Pennsylvania or Tennessee, I think one good thing that can come from this is that we, that we remove from our minds this concept that our Christianity is limited to what we do in a church building on the first day of the week. 
And I really do believe that that sometimes people have that concept that as long as I'm in a church somewhere on Sunday, I'm a Christian. When you look at the model of the first century church, they did that, absolutely. They, they assembled upon the first day of the week. They worshiped together. But their, their, um, their function as the body of Christ, which is what the church is, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, their function as the church was so much more than just going to a building. And it, maybe, <clears throat> it may be that this is a problem that particularly we, we face in America because, you know, this is the church. The buildings, I'm, I'm going to church, as we often say, and we fail to understand at times what it really means to be the church, to be God's people. So I'm just going to give you some examples from Scripture. So going to Acts chapter 4, if you have your Bibles with you, um, I'm going to Acts chapter 4. So you have the church being established in Jerusalem as recorded in Acts chapter 2. Now what you have, and you read about this in various places in the New Testament, and I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i touch on that as I go through here. <clears throat> but what you have here in the New Testament um, is the, the early chapters of Acts. You have a lot of people obeying the gospel within the city of Jerusalem. And of course, beginning in Acts chapter 8, the gospel goes beyond Jerusalem. It goes into Judea and Samaria, and then ultimately all the way to Rome um, by the hands of Paul, according to Acts chapter 28. But within that early um, model, we have disciples who are in need. This is what I'm getting at with our question, is there anything different? If, if we limit our Christianity to going to a church building on a Sunday, we don't know what Christianity is. Um, now, again, that's a part of it, absolutely. But there's so much more to it than that. So I'm here in Acts chapter 4, just, just by way of example. So beginning in verse 30, and, and so let me say this too. So before I went live here, I scrolled on Facebook, and I saw a bunch, a, a bunch of guys that I know personally who are on Facebook, standing alone in a church building, talking to a camera or talking to an, uh, to a, to an iPhone. But they're presenting God's Word to people who are, who are joining them uh, in avenues like this. So we have, we have multitudes of people, according to Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, have, who have obeyed the gospel, they've believed. And I want you to listen to the language here that's descriptive of God's people. They were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Um, verse 34, now, now, uh, now was there anything, nor was there anything among them, anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the uh, proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named uh, Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement or consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Their, their concept of being the church, their concept of being Christians, uh, I really do believe was much, uh, much richer and much deeper than sometimes what we today imagine Christianity to be. It was a lifestyle. It wasn't going to a building once a week. Uh, it wasn't going to a building on Sunday morning at 1045 and Sunday night at 6 and Wednesday night at 7. Now, let me say this while I'm saying that. I am not denigrating those things. I'm not disputing the necessity of those things. That's a whole other subject, and that's not what I'm talking about. These Christians understood there was a lot more to Christianity than just assembling together and worshiping together. These, these people are meeting people's needs. And uh, that's what Christians today are to be about as well. And we can't limit our view of Christianity to what happens in a church building. And if we do, we miss it. We don't know what we're, we, we don't know what we're doing, if that's what we think Christianity really is. So over in Acts chapter 10, as Peter goes to the first Gentile, this is the first Gentile convert to the Lord's church, uh, Cornelius. Cornelius is a soldier. He's a good man. You read the first three or four verses of Acts chapter 10, you learn that he's a God-fearing man. And he's doing the best that he can with what he knows to do. 
as a Gentile. Peter is given the opportunity to go and preach to him. And so I'm going to start reading in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, just down to verse 38, and I want to notice something that's said here of Jesus that we should be about. Uh, Acts 10, 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, that is after Jesus' baptism, which John preached. Now listen to Acts 10, verse 38. And, and th this will help us understand that there's so much more to Christianity than going to a church building. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good. So we have four records of the life of Christ. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, each of those men recorded what they saw, what they witnessed. They recorded it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus promised them in John chapters 14 through 16, when I leave, I'm going to send, my, I'm, I'm going to send the Spirit of truth, and he's going to bring everything to remembrance that I've taught you. So that, that's what's happening um, when, when the apostles are writing these things down. Jesus went about doing good. So we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see that. I think Mark, Mark's gospel is unique in that it's a gospel of action. It, I mean, it starts in Mark chapter 1, and it just immediately gets into the ministry of Christ. You have Matthew and Luke, which start prior to that, obviously. They both record the, uh, the uh, conception and birth of Christ. John starts in eternity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So each gospel is unique in, in, in what it records and how it starts, but each gospel records what Peter says here to Cornelius, that Jesus Christ went about doing good. A great example of that, we don't have, I'm not going to do it for you, but read Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 is just a great illustration of what we're talking about. The, to, to be the church... If we're going to claim to be the church of Christ, and a lot of people have a misconception about that, um, it does matter what we call ourselves. You can't call your thing anything, you, you can't call yourself anything religiously and be okay with God. Um, the church is, according to Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, married to Christ it's the bride of Christ. You better be wearing his name, not a denominational name. It, it absolutely matters. And we can't look any different from the first century church today. If we're calling ourselves by some, some other name, we're doing it wrong. We've got to do what God's word says here. Jesus went about doing good. So I was in Acts chapter 4 earlier where these early disciples find those who were in need and they're distributing to those who have need. They're, they're bringing funds to the apostles, and the apostles are distributing those things as, any, as everybody had need. So that continues. You read through, uh, through, in through to Acts chapter 11, and you see that very thing um, continuing. Now, an interesting passage is over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and here's, here's what we need to understand. You know, a lot of times... 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2 were used to say, well, we are commanded to, the church is commanded to give of their means every first day of the week. In a sense, that's true. And let me say what I, let me explain what I mean by that. So listen to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Well, and, and I'm also, I'm also going to read verse 3 because we need to keep it in context. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. On the first day of the week, and the Greek actually says on the first of every week. On the first of every week, let each one of you lay, lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. See, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. He was getting ready to come visit them. He said, you need to get this collection together so that when I get there, you don't have to kind of scramble around and, and uh, figure out where all the money is. Well, what are they doing with this money? What's going on? Look at verse 3. And when I come... Whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. The collection that they were taking up was being done upon the first day of the week because that's when the disciples came together. And the specific purpose for this collection was to send it to Jerusalem 
as a gift. And uh, and then, then, of course, you have verse 4. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So they're going to send a group of people with this money collected up by Corinth to Jerusalem. It wouldn't be good to send one man with a big sum of money. Something could happen along the way. Um, but anyway... Uh, this, this, this is a special collection taking place here for the saints in Jerusalem who were poor. We see the same thing, now this is written later, but we see the same thing happening there in Acts chapter 4. Now there's another passage that addresses this very issue over in Romans chapter 15. And uh, let's see. Ver uh, okay, so Romans chapter 15 beginning in verse 25. Paul says, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. How was he going to do that? For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So he's talking, Paul's talking to multiple congregations, Rome, Corinth, as he says in 1 Corinthians 16, the churches of Galatia, about meeting the needs of, of poor Christians in Jerusalem. And as you go over to 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, he talks about the very same thing. Uh, so let me look here. Um, Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 10, he says, And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago. That's talking about the collection that he wrote about in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. What you were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must also complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may it be completion of what you have. For, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. So you have this contribution mentioned again, Romans 15, uh, 26, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. This is what the church of today needs to look like. Uh, when people have need, the church needs to come together and meet those needs. Okay, so we had a tornado go through Jonesboro, Arkansas yesterday. Did a lot of damage. I have some good friends in, Arcan uh, in Jonesboro that I texted. They're all okay, thankfully. But there are going to be people in need. What does the church look like? What, what's it going to do? What do God's people do when people are in need? And, and you know, I know, I know there's a view out there that, that exists that... Um, the, the church cannot give collectively of their means, but I want to let's think about that for just a minute. I, so I can give individually, but we can't give collectively. I don't find that precedent in Scripture. Um, but there are those who hold that view uh, that the church cannot do that. Let, let me tell you something. It's God's money, whether it's in your wallet or whether it's in a little, in a little plate at the church building. It doesn't matter where the money is. What matters is what we do with it as God's people. Is So do we look any different today than the church of the first century did? I would say in many cases, yes. Some in things that don't matter, okay, like a church building. We don't have to have a church building. Um, if, if, the, if the building here in Mammoth Spring burnt to the ground, the Mammoth Spring Church of Christ would still exist. We look different in that way. But we shouldn't look any different from the church of the first century in terms of what we're talking about this morning, helping those in need. Um, in, in terms of following the example of Jesus, who according to Acts 10, 38, went about doing good. And it's interesting. So there, there are at least three different words in the Greek New Testament that are translated as good. And that word there in Acts 10 and verse 38, Jesus went about doing good, is a term that means he went around being a benefit to others. He was helpful to others. So I think of... I th I th in my mind, I think of passages like Matthew chapter 9 and verses 9 to 13 where he went to, to eat with, um, with publicans and sinners and the Pharisees could not believe that he would eat with that type of person. You know, if he were really the son of God, he wouldn't be with these type of people. But that's exactly who he came to be with. Those are people who need the gospel. Um, and, and in fact, that's what Jesus says there in Matthew chapter 9. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So as God's people today, the point being, as God's people today, whether individually or collectively, we better look like that. We'd better be functioning like that as individual Christians, as congregations of God's people. 
So, um, uh, okay, so in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I looked at chapter 8 just a minute ago. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is still uh, talking about this contribution that's being collected um, for the poor saints in Jerusalem. But in, in 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 10 through the, I guess really through the end of that chapter, verse 15, Paul, Paul uses this word liberal several times. And he's talking about the fact that they should be freely giving, freely contributing to what's going on here. Um, verse 11, for example, he says, While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of this service. And again, the this service is the collection that was being taken up. He says, For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God, while through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ. In other words, you're living in harmony with what you said you are by doing this. And for your liberal sharing, now listen to this, the end of first, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 13. And for your liberal sharing with them, okay, with the Christians, with the saints in need, and all. To say that a church as a collected body cannot give to non-Christians makes no sense biblically. They helped the needy saints, but it also says they helped all. And there's another passage right next door to that one. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Uh, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Listen to that. Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So, number one, who is all? Well, that's all. That doesn't exclude anybody. And Paul's talking to the churches of Galatia here. We need to do good to all. Well, how do you do good to all? Well, you do good. You help them out. You do what you can to assist in people's in, in the needs of people. Is there anything different? There shouldn't be. Again, there may be some minor differences. There may be some differences of appearance in the sense, again, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, you know, today we have church buildings. Uh, we have these structures that exist where we can assemble together out of convenience and worship together. They didn't have that in the first century. They met in church, uh, the, uh, the church met in pe different people's homes. Church looks different in that way. But in our day-to-day -day function as God's people, we, we shouldn't look any different. I think of James chapter 1 and verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and orphans, uh, to visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That word visit there means to come to the aid of to help, to assist. That's what God's people had better be doing individually, collectively, whatever it takes. We don't have any right today to look any different than Jesus. We don't have any right to look any different than what that early church did in meeting the needs of the people around them. Whether it's Now, there are a couple of different needs that people have. Physical needs, physical needs, obviously. There are people who need those things. The greatest need that people have, though, is, is spiritual. Um, everybody, so over in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, uh, we're told that, um, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Everybody needs the gospel. And again, whether we're talking collectively or individually, uh, we need to be looking like the first century church looked. We need to be doing what they did, functioning like they functioned, um, Worshiping, yes, absolutely. Assembling on the first day of the week, absolutely. We need to be doing those things as the New Testament laid them out. But again, as I've said, and this is where I'll wrap it up this morning, I appreciate all of you joining in here. We've got 76 on the live stream, um, several comments. I appreciate all that. And again, this is just, this is different. We're in a different time right now. Hopefully it won't last too long. But um, I appreciate all of you who are joining in here today. We need to be worshiping God through this. We need to do what we're supposed to be doing on the first day of the week. But let me tell you, as Christians, we better be doing what we should be doing every day of the week. And if we limit our view of Christianity to what we do inside four walls on a Sunday, we're missing the point of Christianity. 
that doesn't take away from the importance and necessity of worship, but we better understand what we are to be about. And I think, again, I think it's summed up in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. As Peter was preaching to Cornelius, God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good. And again, that word good meaning to be a benefit to others. We better be being a benefit to others as God's people. So um, I'm going to wrap this up. I appreciate all of you who joined in today. I hope this study has helped you today. And Christians, I, hope, I tell you what, I hope you're worshiping at home if your congregation is not meeting publicly. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's the first day of the week. I'm going to leave this building. I'm going to go home, and uh, I'm going to worship with my family. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're going to do those things that we should be doing on the first day of the week. The, uh, the crisis, I guess we'll call it, the crisis that's going on in our country right now does not excuse the Christian from being a Christian. Uh, we still have our responsibilities to keep. So that's all I have for you. And uh, thank you again for joining in and appreciate all your comments. I'm glad to see that my son joined in here. Glad to see his name on here. Uh, but all of you, thank you for joining in today. And uh, as you know, I will... Uh, See you on here again, as I do typically day to day. I try to do a video a day uh, from our Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. So thanks for tuning in, and I will see you on the next video.